big guest is already standing by. Let's get straight to him. I mentioned at the top, Penn State spring football. Last year, they had another January bowl game. Lots of stability in the program. James Franklin about to start his ninth year there, and he'll be there a while. Just signed a 10-year extension a few months ago. His QB returns, but some changes, like a new defensive coordinator, whom you'll get to see in their spring game this coming Saturday, right here on the Big Ten Network, which does bring us to our big interview. James Franklin joins us. And James, let me start with this. How is this your ninth year at Penn State? I, I know. I know, it's crazy, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, longest I've ever been in my career. And um, obviously when you get to a good place like Penn State and you have the type of support that we've had and we want to continue building. What is your biggest goal this upcoming spring game on Saturday? Well, obviously, no, number one, it's always to stay healthy. But, but on top of that, you know, have an opportunity to continue to evaluate our roster. Um, quarterback position, you know, running back position, you know, some of our young linebackers that need a bunch of reps. Um, so, yeah, we want to continue to be able to evaluate our roster, you know, stay healthy, and then be able to go into the offseason with a really good idea of kind of where we're at. Uh, I'll set up individual meetings with all the players, give them the feedback that they need to, to work on, uh, and the coaches will all hit the, hit the road recruiting. Should we change what the spring game is? I don't mean you and me, although we'd make a nice partnership. I'm saying college football in general. Is the spring game what it should be right now or should it be a little different? Could you, could you give me a little bit more specifically what you're asking? Sure. Well, I feel like the spring game has become a lot more of we're really trying to make sure more than anything nobody's injured. It's not actually a game. There have been some talk about maybe you play an FCS team instead of having an interest squad. I'm curious if you're like, you know what, we could do a change. Or if you're like, I actually like the way it is. Yeah, you know, it's. I thought that's what you were getting to, but I just wanted to make sure. So I, I think the first thing is obviously the transfer portal has changed things. You look around the country, a lot of people's depth uh, is not what it normally is dur during spring ball, so that has definitely played a factor into it. Uh, and then obviously there was conversations. There was conversations about, um, you know, possibly playing FCS or what we used to call 1AA opponents, uh, especially from a regional perspective. Um, I think... You know, you could make that argument that that could be a good thing for college football. Um, you know, for us, we, we've always tried to play a game, um, split the team up. You know, we have some depth issues this, this spring uh, that make that a little bit more challenging. So we'll probably be a little bit more offense versus defense this spring game, uh, but hopefully still get a lot out of it. But, yeah, I think it's I think it's something that you could you could really have a conversation about it and take a deep dive. But there's a lot of topics um, that we probably need to take a deep dive in in college football. And I don't know if I would put the spring game at the top of that list right now. What would be at the top of that list for you? Well, obviously, you know, with everything that's going on with NIL and what's going on with, with the transfer portal, um, I think, you know, in terms of guidelines, you know, is it just going to be a total free-for-all like it is right now? Or, or are there going to be certain guidelines, you know, certain times a year, um, you know, um, is there going to be, you know, any type of, you know, national regulation, whether it's from the NCAA, whether it's from, um, you know, Congress, uh, you know, how, how are we going to handle all this? Because there's probably been more changes in college football and college athletics in the last five years than maybe in the previous 25 years. Yeah. Give me an example on what you've seen this spring with your team that surprised you, whether it's a trend, a unit or a player specifically. Yeah, I wouldn't necessarily say surprises. You know, last year we had a big loss in Adisa Isaac, who we lost b before the season started. Um, so having him back, um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say was a surprise, but watching him flash out there is exciting because he was going to be a starting defensive end for us last year and, and felt like he had a chance to be a difference maker. So having him back has been, it been really nice. Obviously the quarterback competition that we got going on, with two guys that came in at mid-semester as high school early enrollees, and then the same thing in the backfield with, with two uh, early enrollees at the running back position. So, um, you know, and then obviously the other big storyline is, is losing Brent Pry, who'd been with me for 12 years to go be the head coach at Virginia Tech, which is uh, awesome. I'm really happy for Brent and his family, and, and really for Virginia Tech, I think he's gonna do a phenomenal job there. But on top of that, you know, obviously us uh, having to replace him and Manny Diaz coming in, 
uh, with tremendous experience, uh, not only as a head coach, but as a defensive coordinator. That, that's been a big storyline for us this spring, obviously. Yeah, I want to get to Manny in a second, but you brought up quarterback play, and I want to go there. You've had this great reputation as a very good recruiter, and you've proven that year in, year out. I'm looking at your roster, James. I see really good depth at the QB position. How do you describe the QB room right now? Well, that, that's that's unusual in today's college football, and it and it's also challenging, you know. So, um, you know, Sean Clifford deciding to come back, um, you know, for a six year, you know, based on COVID was extremely valuable, I think, for both him and us. Um, and then also for for the guys in the room um, to really be able to learn from a quarterback who's really kind of su- seen it all and done it all. Um, you know, is is won 11 games as a starting quarterback. Um, you know, when we went to the Cotton Bowl, New Year's Six Bowl games, uh, his face challenge and adversity, and uh, I think he's got a chance to have a, a a really really strong year this year. But he's also just been great for you know the guys in that room. You know, competition with Christian Bayou has been great, uh, and then the two young quarterbacks having him in the room. Um, them being able to understand and learn from his perspective, I think, is really valuable. I know talking to, you know, the parents of those two young quarterbacks this past weekend, they just talked about how how great Sean has been with them in the room. So, um, you know, uh, there's a lot of value in it, and obviously, it, it puts us in a much better position this year than than probably last year from a depth perspective. Where do you want Sean to grow this year? Yeah, I think it's it's probably, you know, the, the consistency we're always trying to at every position and specifically the quarterback position is is eliminate the three or four plays a game um, that I know he'd like to eliminate and we'd like to as a staff that um, that you're always trying to eliminate. You see it on on Sunday afternoons in the NFL, there's three or four plays a game. Um, that you're trying to eliminate, whether it's a poor decision, whether it's a turnover, you know, whatever it may be. Um, and I think, you know, Sean, through all of his experiences, is in the best position to do that, you know, at, at any point in his career. One more QB question. You know, last weekend, the USFL started. Next year, the XFL is going to start. How much do you think a certain QB out of East Stroudsburg would have loved to have two leagues like that in spring football available to him? Yeah, t- two more opportunities to be disappointed and turned down. <laughs> there's, there's no doubt about it. You know, it, it's funny when I look back, I had so much confidence in college and felt like I could play, you know, at the next level. But obviously, you know, um, now after being in this game for as long as I've been in, I was right where I should have been. I was a, I was a pretty good Division II quarterback and had a really good college experience. But I do think it's great for the game of football, and I do think it's great for a lot of those bubble guys to have opportunity to continue to play and, and have a chance to be developed. Uh, and some of those guys are going to have great stories where they're going to make it to the NFL and, and, and have great careers, and these other opportunities play a part in that. So I think it's great. I think the other thing that's smart is they're not trying to compete with the NFL anymore. Um, they're embracing, you know, the NFL, um, where in, in years past people tried to take on the NFL, and I don't, I don't think that was a, a wise model. So I think this makes a whole lot more sense. You mentioned Manny Diaz, your new defensive coordinator. What have you learned about him in the last handful of weeks? Well, I think a lot of this stuff that is kind of reinforcing what I already, you know, thought. And, you know, and it makes sense, right? You know, obviously not only has he been a successful, long-term, highly respected defensive coordinator, um, but there's tremendous lessons and value um, that he has learned as as being a head coach and being a head coach of a big-time program. So um, he's got tremendous presence in front of the room with our players. He's got tremendous presence in front of our staff. He's got a lot of conviction in, in what he wants to do and how he wants to do it, which I think is, is critical. Um, and he's been in a lot of different experiences that, that we're going to gain, you know, we're going to gain value from. So um, I've, been, I've been really pleased with him, uh, really excited with him. I think he's fit in really well. He's hit the ground running. Uh, and I think he's got a chance to help our defense, you know, take the next step, which we've been pretty good on defense. Hiring a coordinator is so important for a head coach. What's the hardest part about going out and finding a coordinator and making sure he's the right one? Well, you know, obviously, you know, what happens is there's a handful of coordinators that are no-brainers out there. And, 
and then you and then you get into a situation where you're competing for them. There's say there's three proven defensive coordinators out there, um, and then there's probably ten programs that are trying to get them. You know, maybe six that have openings, and maybe four that don't have openings. But if they could get a guy like Manny Diaz, they will have an opening. Uh, I hate to say that, but that's probably the truth of it. Um, so then that, be that becomes the challenge is, okay, we've identified who we want, how do we get them, and then hopefully you're in a position as an organization that you have the support from the athletic director um, from a budget standpoint to go get them, you know, because that's going to play a factor in this uh, at the end of the day. So, you know, we've been fortunate to, you know, get on Manny really early on. Um, uh, had some really good conversations. I think there was mutual interest right from the beginning. Um, you know, then it was, you know, how quickly can we get this done and how quickly can we get you here if this is what you want to do? And, and really kind of the stars aligned and it made a lot of sense. So am I, am I right in understanding? It feels like it's not like a formal, hey, let's bring you in and do a job interview. It's more you know the type of person you want to go after and then you see if they're interested? Well, I think it really depends on are you hiring a, a, um, you know, a sitting coordinator uh, are you hiring an up-and-coming coordinator, um, or are you hiring a coordinator that is, you know, in great demand and, and everybody's coming after him? So, you know, more times than not, you'd like to be able to sit down and, and do a formal interview, uh, you know, when, when possible. But sometimes that's difficult. If you're going to hire a guy that's already a coordinator somewhere else, obviously the program that they're working for at the current time uh, is not going to be excited about that. Uh, and then like a guy like Manny who becomes available on the market, uh, then it becomes, uh, like, I, like I mentioned, it becomes a real competitive aspect to this. So whenever you have the time to go through a formal interview process, you'd like to do that. But sometimes if you've known the guy for a while, you've had a lot of discussions over time, then, then a lot of that stuff can happen over Zoom or, uh, or through phone calls. So Manny would be a guy who's more of an established coordinator, I would be someone who'd be categorized as like an up-and-comer. So what would you want to ask me in a coordinator interview? Well, as much as I love you, the up-and-comer term or phrase is probably a significant stretch for you. What? Um, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, to, to break it to you. But yeah, you, you'd be like a four interviews uh, you know, before, before <laughs> you'd even have a chance, to be honest with you. Okay. All I heard was you would interview me. So I'm taking that as yeah. a win. That's a good yeah. one. Yeah, well, you, you know, you got a beautiful voice for radio. <laughs> uh, and a face for radio, <laughs> right? Go ahead. No, you know, no, 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 I'm going to give it. You know, <laughs> you know and th these, those are the things we say off air. I'm not going to say that now. You, you know, you, you got a great face for TV, too. <laughs> You're a good man. Before I let you go, I want to ask you about your AD. When you took this job, there was no athletic director. That's how much you wanted the job. But if a university president came to you and said, James, we got to get a new AD, what is most important to you in an athletic director? What would you say? Well, just, just to kind of expand on your story a little bit, when I took the job, I didn't know who the president or AD was That's going right. to be. They, That's were, right. they were both interim. Um, so, yeah, I think obviously there's been a great foundation laid here, and, and President Barron did a phenomenal job, and Sandy Barber did a phenomenal job. We were together the entire time. Um, but now uh, Dr. Ben Deputy, our, our president, um, has, has been phenomenal. She actually spoke to the team yesterday after spring practice. She's got great energy and passion, and, and she loves college football, which is, which is great. Um, but now, obviously, you know, uh, Sandy Barber is retiring, and, and we're going to have to find uh, the next leader of Penn State Athletics. So, you know, somebody that's going to be bold and aggressive and and know how to navigate the university and, and know how to navigate major college athletics and how do we put all 31 sports in the best position to be successful, but also, obviously, how, how do we put football in the best position to be successful so that, so that we can help support all those other uh, 30, 30 sports. So um, it's a huge job. It's, it's a challenging job, but there's been significant interest, as you can imagine, in being the athletic director at Penn State. So... Um, I'm looking forward to, to whoever we bring in, and obviously with a 10-year contract, um, you know, the relationship with the football coach obviously factors in. James, always fun talking to you, and I await your call or email on when you want to set up that interview for a potential coordinator job down the line, okay? Well, be patient, okay? Be patient. <laughs>
Thank you, James. Have fun Saturday, man. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right, we got a lot of football coming up on Saturday. You can see James and the spring game and, and judge for yourself if Manny was a better hire than me. That yeah, they were flipping with joy in New Orleans as the USFL launched this past weekend. And for the Breakers, it launched with a victory. The first week of the revamped Pro Football League, trying to start a new tradition, spring pro football in the U.S. They've signed up plenty of familiar names, including one near to our hearts, Jared Thomas, a former Big Ten Network intern, current offensive lineman for the Breakers, is good enough to join us now. Jared, one what, what of the worst questions you can ask is how did it feel, right? So I'm not going to ask that. But I am, because it wasn't a regular game you played in. It was the first game in the launch of a brand new league. So what did that game feel like? Well, first of all, thank you guys for, for having me on. Um, what a great opportunity for myself, um, being a former intern for you guys. So I appreciate the thoughts um, of bringing me on. But I would say, first and foremost, as a league, I mean, what, what a great opportunity. Um, we're here in you know Birmingham, Alabama. Uh, where, you know, football in the South is a big deal. So to have a league launch its first weekend, its first inaugural week um, of football was pretty special. And I think on a personal level, um, this was my first time playing outdoor football since November of 2019. So it had been a long time coming for myself. So just the the nerves and the, the energy that I, that was just bottled up inside was just, I think, put on full display, not just from a personal level, but, you know, as a league, because so many guys were put in a position to, to go out and be successful um, for this first weekend. But also we have nine more weeks. So it's, uh, you know, just the scratch in the surface level was to come here in the future for the USFL, for myself personally. And, you know, I think everyone loves football when, when the NFL ends, when football's over, college football's over. It's like, man, when, when can football start again? So I think this does a great job of um, acting as a substitute for, for some spring football. How did this come into your life? Did, did you reach out to someone? Did someone reach out to you? Well, hopefully my agent doesn't see this because I'm sure he'll get a good kick out of this. But I actually uh, mentioned it to my agent at first, and he was a little pessimistic because he hadn't heard anything on his end. But I think it just speaks to the time that we live in here in 2022, back in 2021 when I first heard about it, that a lot of things were released on social media via Instagram. And my agent isn't ancient in his age, but he's just not as technologically savvy as most uh, kids or, you know, adults around my age demographic. So when I first mentioned it to him, he, he I don't want to say he shot it down, but he just wasn't very optimistic about it. And then lo and behold, it was like a snowball effect where, you know, one release came after another, questionnaires were being sent out, uh, just different things, surveys were being sent out, and it was happening super, super fast. And he, and he quickly became a believer uh, soon after. But I actually was a uh, I was signed to go play back in the IFL with the Spokane Shock. And uh, that was very much a reality until about a week before the draft. So it, it was definitely a, just a whirlwind of emotions for myself, just because I, I thought I wouldn't get picked up um, for this league to, to start out because it was just getting so much closer to, to draft week and draft day that I was like, man, I'll just prepare myself to go play arena again. But, you know, things kind of swung in my favor and here I am. You played in one of the best conferences in the country for college ball. So you have perspective of what it's like to play with and to play against talented players. How good is the football in the USFL right now? Well, I think one thing that people have to understand is that everyone in this league has played at some point in time. Uh, if they haven't, have been really close to the NFL, like myself, or have played at the highest level for four and five years in the NFL and are trying to get back or just want to continue to play football. So the level of competition goes from an amateur status where, you know, guys might just be going to college to get a scholarship to get themselves, you know, ready for the next step of their life. But in the USFL, these are all guys that take football very, very seriously. They're trying to get the next opportunity. They're trying to, you know, provide an opportunity uh, for their family or to, to provide for their family. So um, you have to take in consideration that these are all guys that have come from all walks of life that have you know, struggled at one point in time that have, you know, been cut by an NFL team that didn't get an opportunity that they felt they should have. So it's just a bunch of guys that are hungry for an opportunity and they all love football. We all love football. And so what a great way to, to display that with USFL and the things that they're doing here in Birmingham. All right, let's turn to your alma mater. Uh, Northwestern in 2018 wins the division. They follow it up the next year with three wins. They follow that up in 2020 by winning the division. They followed that up by winning three wins. Jared, you know what mean that that you know what's coming this fall. <laughs> we better win the Big Ten championship. That's all I know. 
<laughs> How do you explain that roller coaster that Northwestern's been on? Well, I think first and foremost, I can speak for a lot of guys that have come through Northwestern and understand that at Northwestern, it's very much a uh, leadership driven program. And, you know, with leadership comes seniority in, in some way, shape or form. So a lot of guys that have been in the program two and three and four years have seen some things. They may not have gotten on the field when they first got to Northwestern, but they've, you know, been in the practices. They've been on the scout team. They've been on special teams. They've worked their way to become a starter. And experience is a huge thing at Northwestern. So when you look back um, to my senior year in 2019, where we go three and nine, we lose a senior class with a quarterback that was a four-year starter who's currently playing here in the USFL. So we bring in a, a totally new uh, faced offense at the quarterback position that's going to, you know, uh, suppose some some struggles there and then you follow up the next year that's a group of seniors that have been playing for two and three years and then you get um, somebody uh, as a senior to come in as a grad transfer and be the quarterback so I think more so than it is wins and losses it's just about getting that experience because experience is the best teacher and I think that Northwestern you know the experience is the cream of the cream and that's at the top when, when it comes to who, who the guys are leading out on the field on Saturday. So I know they're working hard. I know spring ball was was probably tough. Winter conditioning was probably tough. But, you know, I think they're going to hit their stride this fall um, based off of the curve that we just <laughs> explained. But I think more so than that, they have a group that has experienced a lot um, of letdown, had experienced a lot of disappointment last year. So I, I know they'll come back hungry this fall and uh, ready to play. Well, they got the head coach who knows what he's doing. He's been able to bounce back from those down years for sure. Tell me something I don't know about Fitz. Man, I guess I got to keep it PG. Well, you don't have to. I mean, it's live TV. <laughs> oh, you can say trust whatever. Me. Tr trust me, I will get a, a text message very <laughs> soon after this aired, so I, I don't know if I want to put myself in that position. But I will say one thing that Coach Fitz has always done is he – just lives, breathes, eats football. So he thinks that he's still, you know, the linebacker that he was back in <laughs> uh, all of those great years at Northwestern. So he'll occasionally jump in and practice and kind of give a look and, you know, say that he'll knock the lineman's lips off and, you know, kind of have fun with it. But uh, that, that's one thing I think that just speaks to Coach Fitz as a person, as a coach, that he loves the game. He played the game, um, and he's willing to, you know, even if it is just on the backside of a rep and, you know, kind of fill a, an air gap, to, to say the least, he, he's willing to do so. And, uh, you know, actually, he just texted me over the weekend before um, the game and, and shot me a text of good luck. So I think that just speaks to him, him as a person, him as a coach, and, you know, why he's the, the all-time winning coach in program history, and uh, he's definitely got some great years ahead of him. Before I let you go, biggest thing you took away from your time as an intern at the Big Ten Network? Man, all of the people that are in the background really make the, the whole operation of a show, of a production really go. Um, from graphics to video editing to, to everything. And I think that's the biggest thing that, you know, stands out to me, um, especially in a game like football. There are so many things that go into a game. There are so many things that go into a show for, for yourself as, a, as an anchor, as a show host. And those are things that people don't always see. So anytime I can, you know, thank those people in the background that are back in those cubicles, a special thank you to those guys, to everyone that, you know, welcomed me with open arms as a as an intern walking around with the water jug. I really appreciate it. But then at the same time, it's, a, it's the same way we see in a team setting as well, because without those coaches doing relentless game planning, without the equipment managers, without the video staff, you know, we couldn't put out a product on, you know, Fridays, Saturdays or Sundays or whatever days we're playing here in the USFL. So super, super thankful for those experiences at BTN and uh, love you guys dearly. I thought you were going to say the biggest thing you learned was the way I like my coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, I did say I can come back and pay it forward, get everybody some coffee. Hopefully I get a, enough money to, to get everyone some coffee. So I'll take care of you guys sooner, sooner rather than later. I don't remember if your beard game was as strong then as it is now. Was it that good back then? I don't think it was as good. It was like, as you were talking with Coach Franklin, it's like up and coming. So <laughs> I, back when I was an intern, it was up and coming, but it's definitely kind of coming to a life of its own. So I'm looking forward to see what it does. It's an established winner now, for sure. <laughs> there we go. Jared, always great talking to you, man. You're such a delight. I'm proud of you for what you're doing. I hope this season is a blast. Appreciate that, Mike. Take care. Yeah, I'll say it was a pretty good week to be Rachel Lewis. Homered constantly, scored in all 10 plate appearances, broke the all-time home run record at Northwestern, and once again, she's the Big Ten Softball Player of the Week. 
Her team's won six in a row. Everything's working in Evanston, and now she's joining us for a chat. Let me start with that historical thing. What was that moment like when you became the all-time Wildcat home run leader? Yeah, it was an indescribable feeling. I didn't, I didn't expect to feel that way, honestly, when, um, when I did it or even when I tied it. I was just ecstatic to even be with those people on that list um, and to have Tammy there when I broke it was amazing. I didn't expect to hit two in one game to actually break it. So just the whole day was unbelievable. The crowd was insane, um, like chanting my name. I've just never been in an environment like that. Um, it was just an awesome feeling to have everyone there, have my family there, all the fans. Um, it was awesome to have a packed stadium at the J that day. And you mentioned Tammy Williams held the record for 13 years. You talked to her afterwards, I assume? Oh, yeah. She had a lot of, she had a few words for me. I'm just super proud. And, I mean, I looked up to her for the past 10 years since I've been committed here and even before. So to have her there, um, have it be her record that I broke, um, I'm just honored to even have my name in the same sentence as her. So it was just a really awesome feeling to have her there. See, she seemed happy. If someone breaks your record, you gotta be angry. I wanna see you on the sidelines like with your fist in their face. Yeah, um, she was awesome with it. I think I would have felt probably similar to what you're describing. I think there was a little bit of like, dang, but also <laughs> she was super happy for me and um, it was just really, really cool. I've been told that you love chatting with former Wildcat players more than anybody really on your team. How come? Uh, they just have a lot of experiences that I've been able to learn from. And I think coming in, I had a few conversations with people early on, like Garland Cooper and Monka and Tammy Williams. And they just really took me under their wing, um, kind of explained what it was like to play for Kate and Carol, which obviously is amazing, but just gave me the ins and outs of playing Big Ten softball and playing at Northwestern and what it really means to um, be a Wildcat here. So. Um, just blessed to have them in my corner um, for the past eight years now, really, since I've been committed. So, Rachel, check my math here. Have you started every game your entire college career? I believe so. Okay, when was the last time you didn't start a softball game? I couldn't tell you. Um, yeah, I really couldn't tell you. <laughs> so freshman in high school, you were starting? Yeah. Goodness sakes. I think the only time I haven't started was when I was injured in high school my junior year. Okay, okay. We found one, one flaw in your yep. lifelong starting goals. <laughs> uh, Rachel, have you ever seen the movie Cool Runnings? I have not, but I've been told to watch it. Yeah, why don't you explain why I'm asking you about Cool Runnings? <laughs> Um, I had an experience where um, I had the opportunity to go out to Park City, Utah and give bobsledding a try. Um, I think it was two years ago now, kind of during the COVID time. So I took the opportunity and kind of ran with it, met some really awesome people, had a really cool experience. Um, and it was just cool to now say I kind of followed a somewhat of an Olympic dream. Um, so yeah, it was awesome. Okay, but how does a softball player try bobsledding? Um, I used to kind of see clips of it on TV or with my mom on social media. And I was like, those girls were kind of built similar to me, just powerful, fast, um, explosive. So I was like, why not give it a try? So I did the virtual combine that year um, because of COVID. So it was like a broad jump, a 40 yard sprint. Um, and just some of my athletic highlights. So I figured those are events I do pretty well in, so I gave it a shot. And how close do you feel you got? Um, I think I could have continued, and I think that opportunity is still kind of there if I wanted to take it. But um, it's definitely not an easy path, but um, much respect to the people that keep going with it. It takes years, so... Okay, but then how is it possible you haven't seen Cool Runnings? I mean, what are you doing, Rachel? <laughs> I know, I think I just got told by so many people that I never actually got around to it. I mean, I don't, I don't wanna you know, <laughs> give you instructions, but that's gotta be your homework tonight, is go watch John all Candy right, be wonderful. All right. <laughs> all right, I'll do it. When you were going through your recruitment for Northwestern softball, is it true Evanston was the only campus you visited? 
Yes, I ended up canceling a couple other visits right after I visited here. I We were driving home from Chicago, um, and it just felt right. I called Kate in the Taco Bell parking lot um, <laughs> and gave her the news that I wanted to come here and play for them. And um, it just felt so right that I couldn't turn it down. Like, you can't turn down the academics. You can't turn down the program and the legacy that Kate and Carol and even Sharon Drysdale have created. Um, and I wanted to be a part of that. So I knew we were going to do big things. How did Drowen react when you told her? She was very excited. Um, I think she likes to recruit athletic players, and I think I fit the mold to that really well. I think she um, coached my style of play. Like, she was aggressive. She knew where I needed to be pushed and where I could be pushed, and that was a big draw for me. Like, she really knew me as a person um, and a player and where I kind of wanted to go with my career. I'm sure she was like, well, you're calling me from a Taco Bell parking lot. This can only be good news. <laughs> Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I was talking to your teammate Jordan uh, last week. She said, you guys have a saying, what would Kate do? Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. We, we have created a lot of acronyms this year just by having fun off the field a lot. Um, and it's kind of, yeah, we have a lot of things. We have, what would our strength and conditioning coach Tyler do? Um, what would Kate say? I mean, we have a lot of things that we're kind of rolling with this year, and I think it just makes the game more fun. So give me an example where something happens, and you're like, well, Kate would do this. Um, well, we have a Kate Drohan dictionary going on our whiteboard in the locker room, um, <laughs> just of the random words she comes up with sometimes. We're like, where did you get that from? <laughs> um, it makes it interesting. It keeps it fun. She loves it. Um, we just play around with it. And um, she's always got some great words of wisdom going. What would she say that you guys as a team need to still get better at? Um... I think this weekend we really actually capitalized on what we've been needing to get better at, which was putting games away when we have the opportunity um, and just closing the door and not giving teams a chance to breathe is something that we always kind of preach. And for the beginning of the season, we would get really close. It'd be like seven to zero and our pitchers would still have to pitch those last three innings. So saving our pitchers arms, um, doing what we can offensively to shorten the game um, and put games away when we can and when we have that momentum on our side. Last thing for you, on Sunday against Purdue, you were intentionally walked three times. What does that feel like? Um, it's a respect thing. I, I, I respect people who do it. I think it's respectful in a way to me. Um, I think I... Uh, my teammates absolutely went wild this weekend when it <laughs> happened, and this whole stadium again was chanting my name, which was insane. Um, but the dugout was going crazy. I thought they were going to break the fence, like cheering so loud. <laughs> and it just fires like Jordan and Maeve up, and the rest of the team, like, it puts the bat in their hands, and they love the moment. We all love that big moment, and we love being in the light. So I think it just it kind of hypes them up a little bit, too, behind me. So, And they can get the job done. So it's been awesome. Man, you are living the life, having stadiums chant your name. Not bad. Rachel Lewis, congrats <laughs> on the great season. Keep it up the rest of the way.